Isaiah 53, which speaks of the suffering Messiah, is quoted in many rabbinical writings, connecting the death and redemption and mission of the Messiah with suffering. The Talmud, the Kabbalah, the Midrash Rabbah, among other Jewish books, confirm that the Messiah will die in similar fashion to how actually Yeshua died. But on the ninth of Av also points to important, the importance of the temple is actually for the Jewish people. You know that today many groups in Israel are working hard in, to have the temple rebuilt soon and its construction should begin any day now for the temple is one of the last piece of the puzzle that is needed for the very end time prophecy of the great tribulation actually to begin. And in the prophecies we're about to look into today, Jesus himself mentions one such prophecy that will trigger the last part of the last of the seven year tribulation. One that is directly connected and requires actually the rebuilding of the temple which needs to be constructed before the second coming. The words of this prophecy is concerned the abomination of desolation and says when you see this Jesus says you know I'm at the door. We're going to look into this term and what it actually means. Now before opening the word as it is our tradition let us bless the word. This is an ancient prayer we can do together. Let's do it together. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and has planted everlasting life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, who gives the scriptures. Amen. Now let us begin by opening up our Bibles to Mark chapter 13 and work our way up to this particular prophecy of Yeshua. The, the, the chapter begins with the disciples pointing out to Jesus how beautiful that first century temple was. This is when Jesus gave the first prediction and said in verse 2, Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be thrown down. After this, surely surprised by the power of this prophecy, three disciples asked Yeshua when and how would this happen and when would the end of the world actually come? This is when Yeshua gave four signs that would continue on into our age, signs that would last for the duration of the church age. The first sign was the coming of false messiahs and false prophets, which we have seen last time. The second would be wars and rumors of wars. The third would be what the Greek calls seismos, translated earthquake, but we understand from the Greek rendering that that word that is also includes strong commotions of all sorts, natural disturbances, as well as political, psychological uproar and the like. The four signs will be famines, a sign of distress, and also of the outcome of the hardness of the heart of man. After this, and before Yeshua brings us to more specific prophecies of the end, he again looks to comfort his disciple and also those who will undergo the great persecution in his name, not only after the resurrection and through the last 2,000 years, but especially during the last seven years of the prophecy of Daniel, we commonly called the tribulation time. And there is something really touching about these prophecies covering verses 9 to 13. As you read them, don't they sound so much like what he, Yeshua, was going to undergo? In just a couple of days from that moment. Something we see in the next chapter, Mark 14 and 15. As if to say, yes, there will be persecution and even death, but I walked the path before you. Look at me. Let's see and compare some of these events. First, in verse 9, he begins by telling them, Be on guard, for they will deliver you to the court, the Sanhedria, which we get our word Sanhedrin, which is the highest, Israel's highest court. But no, no, notice how in the next chapter, Mark 14 begins with verse 1 with the words, And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize him and to kill him. He was actually the first to be arrested. Second, he warned the disciple in verse 12 by saying that brothers will hand over brothers actually to death. But this is what happened when a very close friend of all the twelve and Yeshua betrayed them, as we read in Mark 14.10. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went off to the chief priest in order to betray him to them. 
Judas Iscariot was the first of a long line of betrayers and deniers of the faith, and surely during the time of the tribulation, this will come out in force. Third, he told them in verse 9, and you will be flogged in the synagogues for my sake. This is why he endured as soon as they arrested him, as we read in Mark 14, 65. Some began to spit at him and to blindfold him and to beat him with their fists and to say to him, prophesy. And the officers received him with slaps in the face. And in the next chapter, chapter 15, verse 19, the same fate came from the Romans. They kept beating his head with a reed and spitting on him and so on and so forth. Another striking comparison is that at the end, Yeshua is killed and is resurrected. So many of the disciples and many believers have been and will be killed for their faith. And these are still waiting for the ultimate resurrection and the second fruit of the resurrection. And so, as he prophesied, he is the first to enter all this mistreatment even unto death. The disciples surely must have remembered that he first walked this path before them. And in so, so doing, for it is written in Hebrews 2.18, since he himself was tempted in that which he, was, he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted, right? They and we know that we can always turn to Jesus and find a friend and comfort. It. Amen. And this comes in a most tragic place in the prophecy for the most difficult prophecy of the end actually follows these words as if he would say to them i am with you in all things you are going through <coughs> and there are two things that are somehow new in this prophecy this is where he tells them in verse 10 that the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. That was the good news of last week, if you remember. This Yeshua actually initiated as well and walked the path before, the, before us. He brought the word to the Samaritan village when many came to believe, a place where actually the rabbis didn't want to go, the Pharisees didn't want to go. He brought and confirmed the word up north, if you remember, to the Syrophoenician woman, not counting the many centurions who came to believe in him. And in the next chapter, he encounters Pontius Pilate, a Gentile who meets and hears directly the word of the Jewish Messiah. Later, believers also carry the torch to the Gentiles, as for instance, Paul, who spoke to Felix, the governor, and later when he was in Roman prison. If you remember, he wrote in Philippians that the cause of the Messiah has become well known through all the Praetorian guards. That means all the soldiers, everybody heard about it because Paul spoke the word of God. And so, and again, we have a friend in Yeshua who is qualified to stand before God on our behalf, but who is also sympathetic with us because he knows how it feels to walk this path. And furthermore, there's another important and new encouragement Yeshua promises. The help of the Spirit of God. I don't know if you noticed it. Look at verse 11. When they arrest you and hand you over, do not worry beforehand about what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you at that hour, for it is not you who speaks, but the Holy Spirit. There's something new. After his resurrection, the Holy Spirit was no more restricted to giving words of hope, etc., just to the prophets. But now the Ruach HaKodesh will take occasion to speak through all believers who live for and with the Messiah. This is a great power that God gives us, who gives the one who is actually willing to walk and suffer with Yeshua. And we have seen in history a great example of this partnership between both man and the Spirit of God. Just consider Peter and John. They were confronted with the same imposing and powerful Sanhedrin. And when they, they, they beat them, and when they spoke to them and told them not to speak the word, they said in Acts 5.41, so they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. It is neither rational nor logical to rejoice after such confrontation but only when we walk very close to the lord we also experience a great power of the spirit and this is the beginning of the fulfillment by the way of the prophecy of joel where the lord promises that we'll pour out his spirit on those days joel 2 28 a prophecy that is cited a little later here yeshua does that 
for his second coming. However, today, this pouring out of the Ruach HaKodesh into the hearts of men who believe with all their hearts, their soul and might, I want to tell you, has already begun. And will go on in the increase, just like the end time prophecies. For judging from what the Lord is saying in these prophecies, we are now living some very exciting times which will become even more as we move on day by day. And so, so far, we have predictions which cover the whole period of time that is these last 2,000 years moving into the tribulation. But it is now when we come to what are very specific prophecies that are part of the Olivet Discourse. We are brought to a very special point in time, something we can today, perhaps more than any other time in history, feel its very close proximity. Let's read verses 14 to 18 of this most important prophecy. This is what Jesus says. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one who is on the housetop must not go down or go in to get anything out of his house. And the one who is in the field must not turn back to get his coat. But who uh, to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, but pray that it may not happen in the winter. Here things will radically change. Just before this, Yeshua listed some prophecies and then told the reader that those things must take place, but that is not yet the end. That's in verse 7. However, here an urgency has developed. Yeshua now says that when one sees the abomination of desolation, not to wait, not to tarry for even a moment, but they are not even to grab their cloak, but instead they are to flee where? to the mountains. But what is the abomination of desolation that will trigger this crucial, so important moment? This is the point I want to tell you when Bible prophecies culminate. They come, when they come together, prophecies are not a matter of private interpretation, as Peter tells us. And so to understand the full implication of this term, abomination of desolation, we absolutely need to seek the Scripture's interpretation. And by God's grace, I want to tell you, it is not that complicated here. The term is mentioned three times in the book of Daniel, a book that Yeshua will refer to more than once concerning this prophecy. First, the meaning of the word abomination is what causes horror and disgust. While the word desolation pertains to what is sacrilege, what is used against all that is holy and pure. In prophecies, this is associated with the temple and the desecration actually, of the temple. The first time we see the term used is in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, where the Spirit of God situates the abomination of desolation right in the middle of the seven-year tribulation. Speaking of the Antichrist that is to come, this is what the prophecy of Daniel says. He will confirm a covenant with many for seven years. In the middle of the seven years, he will put an end to the sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up the, an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Daniel, who prophesied this moment, gives us the timing of the prophecy of the end times. He tells us that it will occur during the last seven years of the tribulation and right in the middle of it. <coughs> now notice something powerful here. He speaks of half of the seven years, and this is when Yeshua says, actually, it will start. According to biblical calendar, where each month is 30 days, half of seven years is exactly actually 42 months or 1260 days. But these are two figures that actually John uses in his prophecies of the book of Revelation. Daniel, Revelation, and Yeshua in Mark 13 speak of the same prophecy. <coughs> in Revelation chapter 11, verse 2, as John is asked to measure the temple of the tribulation times, the one that is about to be built in Jerusalem today, he is told to live at the courts of the Gentiles, the courts which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations. And they will tread it upon foot for the city for 42 months. 
The court of the Gentiles may very well be where the dome of the rock is now standing. This is given to them for now until Jerusalem is treaded down for 42 months after the temple is actually built next to it. Second mention of these 42 months brings us right to the description of the Antichrist and the false prophet or the last false Jewish Messiah. And there we read that the Antichrist, there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for only 42 months. That's Revelation 13, 5. <coughs> and this is when he will be at the height of his rebellion, for he's given only 42 months, no more. This is what the Lord asked the believer who will undergo these things, mainly Jewish believers in Israel, during the time of the tribulation, to be looking for. In his mercy, God gives the timing to be known in advance. 42 months equals 1260 days. The Spirit of God also uses the figure to warns the elect. This figure is found in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, where it is explained that the remnant of Israel at the time will be protected for this specific period leading to the second coming of Yeshua. There we read. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared by God, and there was, she was nourished for 1,260 days. Yeshua told the woman, who is Israel, to flee to the mountains, which is here, the wilderness. However, he also prepared a place for her, for he will nourish her for these 1,260 days. In the prophecy of Mark 13, he told Israel not to carry anything, for he will, Jesus will provide for her. As he provided for Israel in the wilderness for 40 years, he will provide for them during these three and a half years. The same figure is repeated in Revelation 11:3, when the Lord promises great power to the two witnesses who are about to come. And I will give them power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days. Here's the number again, clothes in sackcloth, while the remnant of Israel will be protected from annihilation. These two witnesses, who some believe will be Moses or and Elijah, or some individuals who will come in the spirit of Moses and Elijah, will then stand as witnesses to others there, I believe, on the Temple Mount. But how would the abomination of desolation be realized for that Yeshua as the believers to take as a trigger for the last 42 months of this age. Notice the word right after he mentioned, let the reader understand. Understand what exactly? The way the Greek is written is not according to the laws of grammar here. If I tell you something like the wooden chair, he stands on four legs. It does not make sense for I should have said it stands on four legs, but what I did is to personify the chair. In the same way, the way the Greek is written, the abomination of desolation is personified. It literally reads, see the abomination of desolation. He will stand where it should not be. Who's the he? This fits very well the subsequent prophecies about the Antichrist, who is the abomination of desolation himself. The abomination is personified in the life of this man. Paul throws light to this verse. He explains it to us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And he says, for that day, that is the day of the Lord, the seven-year tribulation, will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, and that is worshipped as, so that he sits as God, in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Here then is explained to us what the abomination of desolation is. He is the man of sin, the son of perdition, the coming world leader called by John the Antichrist, who will come into the temple and sit there and proclaim himself as God. This is the sequel of that last link of Satan's sin. Attempted to fulfill that greatest sin when he wanted, you remember in Isaiah 14, he wanted to ascend into heaven and exalt his throne above, the, 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 above God, that is. But he could not do it in heaven, so he tries here on earth by sending this man whom Paul calls the son of perdition and in imitation of the son of God. This will be, by the way, his last try. Originally, Daniel uses these two words, abomination of desolation, to explain how the Holy of Holies in the temple was desecrated. 
This is when Antiochus, back in 175 BC, offered the pig on the altar and put the statue of Zeus later on. And to fulfill the full realization that is of the abomination of desolation will, be when, will not be when an animal will be actually offered. It will be when the beast, like Daniel and John calls this Antichrist himself, will come and sit and take over that temple. This is then what is behind the word abomination of desolation that Yeshua is asking the believer of the time of the tribulation to be watching for. This does not pertain to us directly, who will be taken away at the rapture before the tribulation, before this time, that is. This is specific to those during the tribulation time who will live in Jerusalem, especially and across all Israel. So fierce would this time be that Yeshua gives so many details about it. But there's another sign, other signs, two more, that will accompany this one that we take from other scriptures. Another is, is back in Daniel 9.27. See what he says again. He says, He, the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for seven years. And in the middle of the seven years, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. A second sign is that he, the Antichrist, will put an end to sacrifice and offering. That means that by the beginning of the seven year, the temple should be up and running. But after three and a half years, this man of sin will stop it from functioning. I realize, by the way, that that sounds so far-fetched to many that the temple will be rebuilt. But you need only to visit the Temple Mount Faithful Museum, where we find all the necessary elements for, for the function of the temple, from the priest's instruments to their clothing, and even to the ancestry of the Levites. Almost everything is ready for it. This is in Jerusalem, by the way. Did you know that today, the only tribe in Israel we can identify with, with certainty are the Levites, whom God chose to take care of the temple worship. We know who they are today. They even have some chromosomes that other Jews do not have. I believe that this knowledge was left to the Jews so that they could recognize and use them for the third temple to be rebuilt. And that is quite amazing considering the 2,000 years have gone by and we can still identify that one specific tribe. The others, we don't know who they are. This temple, Mount Faithful, have even built a menorah. You know the menorah that will be in the third temple is on display in the Jewish quarter in the old Jerusalem. For the Jews in Israel, religious and secular, it's not that far-fetched anymore since they have been praying for this temple daily to be rebuilt. It's part of biblical prophecies. Daniel's prophecies always also tells us what will trigger the last seven-year tribulation. He says that he, the Antichrist, he will confirm a covenant with many for seven years. The moment a powerful politician signs a covenant of peace with Israel for seven years, you know that the tribulation had begun. This is why during the description of the war of Gog and Magog, we find Israel with open borders. This would be due to the signing of the false peace covenant. As Gog attacks Israel, the Lord says, and they are living securely, all of them. This is where you're going in verse 8 of, of Ezekiel 38. And the signing of a false covenant is what Isaiah calls twice over a covenant with death. Isaiah 28, 15 and verse 18. This is also why we see in the opening words of the tribulation time in Revelation 6. As I looked, John says, and behold a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went and conquering and to conquer. That's the Antichrist. Here is one who has a crown, but he's no king at all. He's the Antichrist, and he has a bow just by itself. This word bow in the Greek is the word for rainbow. It is a word used for a covenant. But this time it is a false covenant, for what follows is war and famines and death. So when they see the abomination of desolation, and when the Antichrist will stop the sacrifice and offering, this will be the beginning of the end. But there's one more sign that Yeshua gives us this time, but through the Gospel of Luke. He says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, you know that his desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Luke 21, 20 to 21. So here three main signs are given for the people to flee to the mountains. 
the taking away of the daily sacrifice, the abomination of desolation, and armies surrounding Jerusalem. <coughs> we are told through Amos the prophet, you know, God says that surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servant the prophets. Amos 3.7. <clears throat> all, all we need to know about things to come is enclosed in the scriptures. The believers will go through, those believers who will go through the tribulation and ourselves as well, we go through this time now, have all we need in the scriptures to strengthen ourselves. And then when, when Yeshua asked the remnant of Israel to flee to the mountain, that by the way, which mountain should they flee to? Surely not up north where we find the mountains of Israel, where the battle of Gog and Magog will take place, and where Armageddon will also take place. But prophecies from the Hebrew Scriptures indicate south of Jerusalem, the mountains of the Negev in the south. The prophets Isaiah, Micah, and Habakkuk gives us the direction they will need to flee in. And all these prophets associate the second coming of the Lord with Bozra, which means sheephold, or Petra, which means rock. For instance, we read in Isaiah 63, verse 1, Who is this who comes from Edom with that garment from Bozrah, this one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling the greatness of his strength? I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. He's speaking about Yeshua. Here Isaiah sees the Messiah coming from the south, Bozrah, and there he, the Messiah is asked why his garments is, are red. He answers and says that it comes from warring against the enemies of Israel. Bozrah, Petra, this is why so many believers, by the way, today who go to Petra, they put Bible in the, between the rocks with the hope that they will serve the remnant of Israel when God will hide them from the devil as it is written in Revelation 12. You know, I remember in one of our trips in Israel, I told the Israeli guide about this prophecy of Yeshua and the abomination of desolation. And told the person to head south to Petra when he sees all these things occurring. The person was very surprised by the mention of Petra until I mentioned Isaiah and Habakkuk. They need to know this, but we know that the two witnesses, which also are mentioned, will be there, right? Perhaps on the Temple Mount will speak of these things. And so Yeshua says that when these things occur, not to wait but to head to the mountains. And he adds, see what he says. But who to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, but pray that it may not happen in the winter. How can we understand this? Why mention those who will be pregnant and would be nursing babies? These words are surprising and incomprehensible if we don't take into account the severity of the time. Perhaps we can compare it to a similar situation at the destruction of the first temple. Did you know that God told Jeremiah not to get married? Why? Because the time were, at, were of wars, of invasion, and not of peace. And so would the tribulation time be. So perhaps these words of Jesus may be a warning of those of the time of the seven years when they see that the, it began just prepare for the second coming. And why not in winter? Surely because in winter the flight will be much more difficult because of the cold and especially, especially because of flooding. During the winter, the what is the river beds can become impassable and very actually dangerous in Israel. This is perhaps why the Feast of Israel began in March and April after the rainy season so the Jews can come from all over the world to Jerusalem. It was known at the time and before that traveling in the winter in Israel was hazardous. This is why, again, the Feast of Israel were at that time. And this is, there's a beautiful story, by the way, attached to the end of the rainy season found in ancient Jewish writings. There we read that God has shown Israel a great goodness. How so? On the 10th of Tibet, approximately January, according to Ezekiel 24, all the Israelites were, had to go to Jerusalem into the exile. This is the day they have chosen. But the Lord said, according to this tradition, if they go on now in the cold, they will die. What did he do? He waited with them and had them go in the exile only in the summer on the 10th of Av. This is when actually they went. So God made sure that the exiles to Babylon did wait until the summer to travel. 
And in Matthew, Yeshua adds, pray that it will not occur on the Shabbat. But why not the Shabbat? In Israel, and increasingly so today, there is no activity on the Shabbat because of the power of the religious who close many areas of the Shabbat. Now, there's something else I want to point out, something important. We see how Yeshua is so adamant on the suddenness of these things and how he tells the remnant of Israel to leave northern Israel and Jerusalem at the first sign. <coughs> Today, there are many Christian ministries, actually, who are working very hard to bring as many Jews as possible back to Israel. With the belief that the more Jews in Israel, the faster Jesus will come back. They are under the false belief that we have entered the beginning of the Messianic times. And so they spend a lot of money and bring Jews from all over the world to Israel. Now, there's nothing wrong for all the Jews to go back to Israel if they want to, but not under false promises like this. But listen to what they say. They use scriptures like Isaiah chapter 11 verse 12 and say, because of you, we are seeing biblical prophecies fulfilled today uh, as we gather the Jewish exiles from the four corners of the earth. When in fact Yeshua himself said, he prophesied telling the Jews to leave Israel when they see these signs. And they even quote on their website, Revelation 21, which speaks of the eternal state as happening right now. They believe based on Romans 11, 11, which says that salvation come to the Gentile to make Israel jealous, that it is the task of the Gentiles to bring Jews to the land of Israel. But it is Yeshua who's going to do that at the end. As for the state of Israel, they, you know that the government loves these ministries and they support these ministries. Do you know why they support these ministries? Because these ministries do not speak the word of God to the Jewish people. They only spend money to bring them there. And so even Netanyahu, he says, these are, there's no better friends than these Christians. He's not talking about us. He's talking about those who give money, but do not speak about the word of God to these Jewish people. The Israeli government will never support the work of evangelism. However, these ministries who are taking a lot of money from the churches are acting on false premises and directing Jews to the land when Yeshua warns us about being there during the end times. We have to be careful to whom we give the money. And so after listing these prophecies, Yeshua then says something very, very powerful about the coming time of, in this planet, that it was to come in this planet. Verse 19. For those days will be a time of tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the creation, which God created until now, and never will. Here he quotes again Daniel and Joel, and after this he will describe the manner of his second coming, which we'll see later on. There will be a time like there was never before, but nor will there ever be. That's the good news, by the way. That is the good news, that it will never be. For after this, a new world will emerge, and the greatest things ever will begin, and we will live in harmony with God and nature. Yes, wars are coming, but short time, 1260 days, 42 months, he says. Three and a half years, no longer than that. And perhaps, he said, I will shorten the day, these days. Perhaps he will, right? But after that, we're talking about a time, a great time of Harmony. This is what is eventually coming in this earth, and this is also coming very soon. <coughs> Whoops, sorry. To conclude, we have considered these signs, which in the overall are not always easy to read, especially that they have begun to show their force and increase in intensity around us today. And I believe they will as we move on forward. So I would like to close with what rabbinic, one rabbinic commentator has noticed about the evil of this world and God's sovereignty. This is what he wrote about the suffering of the diaspora of the Jews in, in the Midrash Rabbah. He says, when Israel are dispersed, the Shekinah, that is the Holy Spirit, is with them. As it is said, the Lord shall return your captivity. It is not said he will bring back, but he will come back. That is, he will come back with you, meaning that he is with you even in captivity, even in suffering, as we have seen as Yeshua actually showed and went through that path before the disciple and many other believers. 
In all these prophecies, the Lord will be there to protect, to cover, and to comfort, as we read in 2 Thessalonians 3. 3. The Lord is faithful, who will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. When our faithfulness is tested, tested that is, we have God's own faithfulness as our resource and anchor. This is his promise. Let's bow ahead in prayer. We'll combine the prayer of Habakkuk and Jude here. Now, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. By your word, you sanctify us. And through your infinite love and kindness, you take great delight in us and give us your spirit. We thank you for these great prophecies you have given us to, to enlighten us. And so we say with Habakkuk, Lord, I've heard the report about you and I fear. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. And so we say, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, our Father, for there is no one like you. And now, Lord, bless our heart. Cleanse us from any wrong motives. Put away our sadness and problems and make us free so that we can reflect your glory to others. And now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy, the only God and Savior through Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen and amen. And to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen and amen. O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen, I have set watchmen.